Ladies and gentlemen, here we are back again on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. You know who I am. And today we have a returning champion, a guest who's come up in the past couple months for a reason we're going to get to right off the top of the bat. But in the meantime, since he was last here, he took it upon himself to expand all of our minds by diving further into a topic that he is fascinated with. And so am I. Uh, Marvelous Old World is the name of his new channel on YouTube. I assume it's also a podcast. Um, Maybe not, but we'll talk him into that. Matthew Smith returns here. On the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast, you know him from dreamdesignbuild.org, Instagram at Yurt Designs, and of course now with the new channel, Marvelous Old World. How you been? You've been busy, obviously. Uh, tell us a little bit about Marvelous Old World and, and what kind of kicked that off. Nothing but busy, Mark. It's <laughs> so good to be back here with you, man. It's Likewise. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah. You know, when I was last on your podcast, you asked me at the end if I... I was going to start a podcast of my own. And I said, hell no, you know, I'm just buried. I got so many things going on. I've got three boys, you know, three, three teenage boys I'm bringing up. I'm running a architectural design business and just had my plate full, but it planted a seed and, and, you know, I was completely willing to leave it up to you professionals in the podcast space and But then I just kept going with my research and, you know, it was just gnawing at me that I really wanted to put it together in, um, you know, not, not necessarily podcast form, but just video form, research video format and just put it out there. So I came up with that name and threw it up on YouTube and yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting process. Um, and, um, if people are interested in any of the topics that we get into, here today um yeah definitely go check out marvelous old world uh, on youtube and if it turns into an actual podcast you know we'll we'll see but just kind of one step at a time right now right on well cool man so obviously marvelous old world's pretty um you know what you're covering is implied but i would say that unlike the average tartaria researcher No slight, no shade to them. I appreciate speaking with a guy like you as opposed to someone whose, you know, reputation is based solely on their Google searches and images they find. You're an architect. You're someone who's been traditionally trained to some degree. You know, you've gone to actual schools. You have a business doing this. You have a degree in architecture. So I don't think it's it's a stretch to trust you more than the average let's say tartaria researcher because a lot of this stuff i see and i i've already you know offended all the tartaria lovers on this show it probably don't even listen anymore because they hate my opinion about tartaria but i'm still regardless of my opinion fascinated by the subject and again you know not uh unwilling to discuss it because i think we need more guys like you approaching this subject uh you know, with maybe a more practical or pragmatic uh, approach. So tell us about that. I mean, what about being an architect? Obviously, I can see why you became interested in this stuff, but uh, Tartarius, you know, um, in particular, but as an architect, you know, how does that change the way you examine Mm -hmm. these so-called old world structures? Mm -hmm. Uh, My first employer... Um, Jack Lubduska, he just passed away. I just found out that he passed away. Um, he was, I think, around 90. He was a beloved architecture professor of mine at NJIT. Um, I graduated there in 2003. It's in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, that's where I got my formal training in architecture. And he he was a master architect, like of the, you know, the old school, you know, draw full scale details, you know, on on vellum you know, an office and he, you know, that's how he learned. And he was, he was so good at what he did. He built, you know, designed skyscrapers in New York and like just real practical knowledge. Um, he had, yeah. Um, he was also a forensics architect. And so when there was a fire, let's say, 
um, or after 9-11, I was going to school when 9-11 happened, you know, and we could see, you know, what was going on in, in lower Manhattan from across the Hudson River from our architecture building. So that really, you know, really left a huge imprint. But the media called him. They called the school, you know, the architecture school and said, who can we talk to, you know, to get a sort of a, a building analysis of, of, you know, the effects of fire on steel and glass and concrete structures. And they, and the school referred the press to Jack Labduska. And so, and so, cause he had this sort of forensic, not sort he had a, a forensics approach where he could analyze a structure and, you know, the forces at play and so forth and provide an assessment of, you know, what, how the fire moved through a building, how an earthquake would affect, you know, structures under different conditions, um, how, how snow loads, hurricane forces, all these things that are thrown at buildings, you know, how does the building respond to it? And at the end of the day, all the sum of all forces has to equal zero, right? That building's got to stand up or else, you know, catastrophe happens. And so, um, I got that sensibility from him, but also through, you know, building. I've always had, you know, a hammer in my hand since I was a kid. I was always, you know, building and playing with materials and just studying materials through through doing and, and putting them together in different ways. And so I just kind of grew up with this sense. And I think that's why um, uh, this professor and I, you know, gravita gravitated towards each other. And um so when I started looking into, you know, these alternative research field, alternative views of, um, you know, our built history, I looked at it as stones don't lie. You know, let's, whatever the narrative says, whatever podcasters are saying, whatever anybody has written down, you know, with pen and ink, um, for me, I'm always going to hold that up to what I see with my own eyes and what I can touch, you know, because many of these buildings, fortunately, are still with us and you can just go look at them. So if there's, you know, talk about, um, you know, mud flood or what have you, you just go look and it's like, okay, what, you know, why are these windows below grade or, you know, um, one of my favorite uh, um and we'll get into this as we proceed, but one of my favorite angles of this research is is the cement, this idea of natural cement. And a lot of people might be familiar with this idea that the earlier buildings, basically a, a lot of the, the grand architecture that this uh, research community is focused on, uh, the state houses, capital buildings, bridges, canals of what, you know, me and many other people call old world architecture. Um, are made are are uh, being put together using this cement that had been forgotten about for a hundred years or so, that was rediscovered uh, when they were doing restoration work on Fort Jefferson um, off the coast of the Florida Keys, and um, they realized that they couldn't just use regular old porcelain cement to repair this building because the building would reject it because there's a chemical bond that occurs. And so they had to, they, they didn't understand what this was. They had to look into it. And so what they discovered was, uh, lo and behold, uh, Port Jefferson, and again, hundreds and thousands of these old world buildings, uh, turns out were, were put together with this natural cement that is basically um, one type of limestone that's mined and quarried from places like the, um, the Rosendale mines in, in the Catskills, which I visited a few years ago. And um, I mean, talk about an old world setting like that place looks ancient. When I went in there, it just absolutely looked ancient. I mean, the, 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 the ceilings of this mine were like 25, 30 feet high. And like the physics of the mining techniques they use sort of defy, you know, the, the modern geological understanding you know just for instance not to get too much into the weeds right now like they they say that with pil it's pillar and i think it's pillar and room or something like that technique where they're basically carving out and leaving they're carving out um, the, the mine materials and they're leaving behind pillars and columns to hold up the roof of the mine 
that modern geology allows for um, geological science allows for um, 40 percent of the material to remain as columns to be structurally sound to continue mining that 60 percent well the 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 rosendale mine that's also called the the widow jane mine they've mined up to 90 percent of the material so even the engineering that goes into this mine like defies modern sense of you know modern scientific engineering and and um modern practices and so the, there's something very special. There's many things, actually, that are very special about this old cement, what I'm calling old world cement. Um, and it's no, it's no small thing that it was forgotten about. And I'm sorry if this gets a little out of order here. Um, they, when I say they forgot about it, it's, it's, I have to pause there. And what I mean is that the industry itself moved on from actual cement and and embrace this portland cement which is much more brittle but it dries fast and whereas this old world uh natural rock cement that's again it's just one line type of limestone and it's made up of silica and calcium which is so interesting because those materials together have a piezoelectric effect piezoelectric property which means that you push you put it under pressure and it's going to produce charge and so the last time i was on your show we we talked about um we talked about electric architecture was getting into this idea of uh etheric architecture electric architecture and like are our cathedrals like really healing structures and are they actually doing something with you know, the materiality, um, they look like crystals, they look like giant crystals, they have rose windows that have cymatic, you know, cymatic forms to them. They're made with sacred geometry. They utilize uh, materials like granite, which again, you know, is full of quartz and has this piece, same kind of piezoelectric property. Well, it turns out in my research, my looking into this natural cement, it too has this sort of piezoelectric quality to it. So then, you know, and so then when I look at these old buildings and I'm thinking, well, you know, to me, they, it, it, it starts to point to a different, a different, um, a different understanding of what electricity is, for instance, a mm -hmm. different understanding of what a building can do, the type of quality that, a um, the effect, let's say, of a building on the inhabitant, whether it's healing, whether it's raising our charge, raising our, helping us to raise our chi, helping us to align with, um, you know, a, a greater energy body. Now, let me ask you this. When we look at Fort Jefferson, and for folks who haven't heard that first interview with, uh, Matthew and I consider going back and listening to that and then coming back to this because we did cover a lot of ground on that episode uh, in the realm of electrical architecture. But for a moment, I was sharing on the screen for all the video people, uh, Fort Jefferson. I'm going to share it again. You won't be able to see it, unfortunately, Matt, because of the way I'm sharing it. Mm -hmm. It's just on the finished end of the product. But just to show people uh, how far away Fort Jefferson is from like land. I mean, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Takes a while before we even see the rest of Florida. I mean, look at how remote this Fort Jefferson is. It's like very far off of what Key West, you know, like where that Key West road ends several miles away from that. So it's pretty mind blowing that they got, enough material there to make it i think what the third largest fort of its kind in the united states next to uh fort adams and fort monroe so yeah it's it's a tremendously you know big undertaking 16 acres 16 million bricks <laughs> the gematria people might be freaking out over that but uh yeah, 16 by 16. It's interesting. Uh, that kind of reminds me of the 40 on the 40th uh, that Ross Ben and Mike Wan talk about. Uh, 16 mm. is multiplied or divided by four. 
But anyways, not to get off in the Gematria weeds here, what do you, what kind of pressure would it take to release energy from these bricks? Are they putting pressure on themselves, just the weight, like from layer to top, bottom to top? Is that pressure sufficient to create a sort of constant charge or a stable charge? Is the, the building itself as it's sitting charged or would it take something like, I don't know, an earthquake or, you know, something akin to, to that to um, activate this energy that's inside of it? Because, you know, piezoelectricity, you could take a, a quartz crystal and strike it and it will release energy, right? That's how watches work. So how do, how, right. what would the intention be for this? Is this maybe a defense system? If a cannonball hits it, would it sort of reflect the energy back? That, I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't know um, the answer to that particular question, but you're right. Watches use it, radios use it. And that's wild just to pause on that one. Like the idea that a, a, a crystal under pressure can receive a signal. So when we start looking at you know sacred buildings placed on ley lines and i know that's a area of interest of yours and these buildings have this quality of receiving not just producing charge but receiving signal if we're just to kind of extrapolate or oh, just becomes very the, the mystery deepens in my mind um can they produce charge just by the uh sheer force of gravity upon you know, pulling one stone or one brick into another and, and compressing them. I believe so. Um, I have opened right now a, an article from sciencedirect.com, and it is titled Piezoelectric Materials for Sustainable Building Structures. And um, the abstract starts out saying that piezoelectric materials are capable of transforming mechanical strain and vibration into electrical energy. And this paper is from just the last, uh, yeah, 2019. Um, the, this property allows opportunities for implementing renewable and sustainable energy through power harvesting and self-sustained smart sensing in buildings. And it's like, are we just rediscovering what, you know, our ancestors or some other iteration of civilization that was here before already knew? And I'm leaning towards that. And again, it's like you, you, you said the T word three times. Uh, starting out. And I, I actually try to avoid Tartaria. I accept at face value that many, that, you know, the community by and large uses that as a placeholder, like mud flood, we use these terms because we're trying to, you know, um, come up with a new story because we're looking at all of these anomalies. Now um, people are using the internet to research and compare notes, put their yeah. ideas out there. So we, you know, we're looking for a new story to kind of, um, one, to make sense of what we're seeing and, and, and we, and we need new stories. We need, the old story is not adding up anymore. The storybooks, the history books, they don't explain what we are seeing. So, you know, we use a term like Tartaria to mean as this umbrella thing, umbrella term to imply this lost civilization, right? That's, you know, right at our doorstep, uh, you know, in cities all around us. And, and I don't like to use it myself because it's also loaded. Right. And I, you know, while we, you know, I look at it in the sense of uh, this idea of egregores, you know, this thought form, like, I feel like it's becoming its own thought form mm. and it has its own sort, sort of like, um, divisiveness like i yeah i've seen the maps too and i see tartaria it was probably an empire like over in eurasia somewhere and what's now russia mongolia and um but it's over there and we're here and this this is america so i call it you know Amer american it, to me it's american well and, and i much prefer to to um, to use the term American, old world American architecture. Right. And I should apologize because you did make that clear the last time we spoke that, <laughs> you know, old world is a more appropriate term. I agree with you. I think, you know, unfortunately, Tartaria has this sort of 
flat earth stink on it where you know you can right. believe that nasa is lying to us without necessarily believing the earth is flat but you know yeah. because that audience is very vocal about their beliefs a lot of people conflate the two i think the same right. thing's happening with tartaria again no offense to any folks no matter what you believe i believe in being open-minded so stick around don't get so upset just because i don't agree with you now when it comes to uh the maps you're certainly right i think one thing that's really fascinating to keep it i guess america centric for this conversation is some of the depictions of america before columbus uh the mm -hmm. way america was depicted on maps and through that research it seems like there's a good case to be made that not only were there advanced civilizations rooted here in america to begin with but advanced civilizations were traveling here prior to columbus's voyage we have a bunch of evidence that the vikings i mean it's pretty much acknowledged that the vikings had mapped out parts of canada and the north atlantic obviously but other groups like the phoenicians the celtics the iberians i mean the people from africa people from china people from russia people from the philippines and and the southeast uh or i'm sorry yeah is it east southeast asian islands that part of the world micronesia i guess you can call it all of these groups had traveled to south and north america prior to columbus so I love the old world conversation, you know, as much skepticism as I have towards the Russo-centric Tartaria theory, uh, I don't extend that skepticism to any of the other old world stuff. So, you know, I, I am skeptical to a degree, but I, I'm not like uh, closed minded, I guess is a more a pro or accurate way to describe it. So, yeah, with that disclaimer aside. You know, anyone who is triggered by the T word or maybe triggered by the lack of the T word, it is what it is, right? So, <laughs> yeah. And again, it's like this to me, it's the stones don't lie. Let's just look at what the buildings are telling us. They're artifacts. Let's right. look at them as artifacts with the story to tell. And whatever we end up, you know, whatever labels we put on it are, are, are you know, a distant second. Mm. Now, Let's start to talk about some of these examples. We've, we've got the Fort Jefferson National Monument, as it's now called. And you know, it's convenient to call these things military forts. You know, there's a sort of secrecy implied with the military where they don't have to give information to just anybody. So I wonder if that is sort of the protocol where these old world structures aren't so much built, but taken over by units and various government factions of the world where they just sort of discover something plant their flag on it and then write write it into history as if they had built it because it's more i don't know politically uh correct to do that rather than say oh we stole this fort it's easier to just you know say oh no we built this remote fort <laughs> yeah and a built uh, you know and shout to um was a conspiracies are us and he's the one that first kind of you know oh. got me looking at I don't know this one. what's that i never heard of this guy conspiracies are us i like that though i'm gonna write that name down we'll look oh, him up it's a really good channel he does really good research and he's the one, first one that i saw looking into this um natural cement question and pointing to these anomalies at fort jefferson and yeah there's lots of like your curiosities about that. It's like, why so remote? Why so big? How did they get all that material out there? You know, you can do an analysis on like, you know, cargo loads for, you know, ships of the time of the late 1800s or mid 1800s and how, how much they can hold, but why it's so remote, so far out. And then apparently it didn't even really get utilized militarily uh, once it was completed and then just fell into ruin. And then now, you know, fast forward to the early 2000s and they were doing this restoration project on it and made this great discovery, which I think is, um, you know, a, a, a clue uh, for this, a major clue for this research. And I think that you could almost take any building and, and determine if it's old world or not by analyzing the mortar. The makeup of the mortar if it's portland cement it was probably built in the last you know century at most 
130 years. Portland cement wasn't really, they didn't come up with it until uh, like 18, mid 1870s, 1880s. And then it, you know, took off as an industrial pro product. But I, why, you know, why this inferior uh, 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 material that had to be imported that had a short life that's brittle, you know, we, our bridges and buildings start falling apart after 50 years. Whereas um, the natural cement, uh, it's also called American rock cement. It's like Roman cement. That it strengthens over time. It lasts centuries and centuries. It hardens underwater. It's much simpler to, to produce because it's one material as opposed to uh, a conglomerate of many different admixtures and so forth, like Portland cement. So the the only thing that I can see that Portland cement has to its advantage is that it sets faster. So if you're trying to build, you know, rebuild or build a new cityscape, a new civilization in a hurry, maybe put, and you don't really care if the buildings stick around all that long, maybe Portland cement would be the way to go. Otherwise, you know, we had this locally available material uh, that apparently built, you know, all of the great architecture of, again, old world America, and then just fell into a disuse as a, um, as a go-to construction material. Um, so it, I find that to be very, very odd. Um, so again, where I put my research in the last, you know, six months, eight months since we last spoke, was just to look at, um, take these uh, ideas and apply them locally. And I'm, I live in the Seattle area. So Seattle has this fascinating uh, underground, you know, you can take an underground tour downtown and there's all these points of entry and there's all this intrigue and lore and history um, wrapped around underground Seattle. So I did my first uh, video for the podcast on underground Seattle. And it was interesting because I had like 30 subscribers when I released that video and it just took off. Like all of a sudden it was like almost 20,000 views on it. And I was like, wow, there's some real interest in this. And uh, so that was the beginning of my research. And the, again, the anomalies, you know, what you said about was there an existing civilization? Were there existing buildings that were sort of rediscovered, founded, and re and claimed, and you know, a new flag placed up, up on top of it? Well, you know, that's pretty much what I found. That's pretty much what I found here in well, Seattle. I mean, if we could go back to yeah. Fort Jefferson, I know you just spent mm -hmm. some time talking about Seattle, but I hate to do this to you, but I mean, to reiterate the point you just made, I mean, I just looked up who designed Fort Jefferson and it is, it just doesn't make sense that these guys would be even employed to do this, like at their level. So let me just tell you the three people who are claimed responsible for Fort Jefferson and the Florida Keys or the Dry Tortugas, uh, Joseph Gilbert Totten. Uh, who fought in the War of 1812, served as Chief of Engineers, and was a regent of the Smithsonian Institution, and a co-founder of the National Academy of Sciences. He was also a member of the American Philosophical Society. All of that before, before he designed uh, this fort, or helped design it, which he is an engineer, so that sort of adds up, but he's from New Haven, Connecticut, interesting <laughs> enough. Know. Uh, and connected to some pretty wealthy up there military families, the Mansfields family, uh, Totten Mansfield is a town named after that family. I don't know if it's the reverse way or what, but let's see. And then there's Louis Agassiz, who has an incredibly long Wikipedia page because, again, someone who it just doesn't seem like he would have the time based on his biography to help contribute to this project. Uh, it, he is a Swiss-born American biologist and geologist, a scholar of Earth's natural history, uh, PhD at Erlangen, a medical degree at Munich, 
um, he, you know, founded the Museum of Comparative Zoology, visited Hartford, Harvard University uh, after emigrating to the United States in 1847. Again, he wasn't even in the United States yet when the fort was being created. It says it was uh, thought of in 1843 or something like that. But uh, and his Wikipedia page is very long, and there's one interesting uh, excerpt about him being a racist uh, and spreading some racist ideas through the um, field of polygenism, which it ex tries to explain the human human origins. Uh, so again, like this guy seems like a dude who would be, I don't know, employed by, again, the folks like the Smithsonian trying to cover up certain aspects of history. Now, this guy, the third guy, really puts it all together. Montgomery Cunningham Meigs, uh, United States Army officer, civil engineer, quartermaster general of the U.S. Army. I mean, these are top level guys designing this fort in a lot of different fields. Uh, and he was a graduate of Yale University. Go figure. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe the historians will say, no, these guys would have done stuff like this. Uh, it does talk about him at other forts. But, yeah, it just seems like these guys were very busy with other things to, you know, go and design this fort that, for the most part, was abandoned within decades of its so-called creation. And in a spot where, you know, Navy Commodore David Porter, who in first inspected it, said this, this is an awful place to build a fort. So we just, yeah, I, mean, I hate to take up all the time, but to your point, there are tons of anomalies with just our first example here. Right. And I, you know, the way I look at it is you, you, you can go mad, like pulling out all the threads and it's like, well, this doesn't add up. This doesn't make sense. And I've been there myself. I put myself in you know, some dark places where it, um, it just seems overwhelming and, until I, you know, I learned to zoom out and realize, well, the, the narrative as it's told is a tapestry. It's a fabric and you pull on any thread and it's going to start to come apart. You, you know, see, so just start to, you know, kind of zoom out a little bit and get more of a bird's eye, you know, view to it and realize that's, you know, that's what it is. It's, it's a fabric. And it is coming apart. And so don't get caught up in any one thread. But yeah, you're right. You know, the, and so just the idea of these architects, like they just ascribe all, all these accomplishments to this and that, you know, historical figure, a lot of, and so when I look into the question of, um, who the architects were, just, you mentioned the Smithsonian, I can't remember his name right now. Um, I wanted to do a video on this and I will, but the Smithsonian building, you know, the Smithsonian. Uh, castle, that exquisite red brick building that's right in like downtown Washington, D.C. The architect that is attributed with that uh, uh, building uh, the, the, um, yes. is a colleague or was a colleague of Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. And he's a, he was a German immigrant who came over here and found that a German newspaper in the, in the German American community that was n newly establishing. And, and he's credited with a lot of buildings in Washington, DC, like really exquisite red brick buildings, the Smithsonian being one of them, but I just find it so, and he was so much a colleague of Engels and Marx that he, you know, there's, um, quotes where Engels phrases him and directly like by name. And it's, what is, how, how is it, how is this? Right. Yeah, I have the an image, an image of the Smithsonian up above my head here for the video audience, and it looks like a palatial estate out there in England with this sort of cherry tree garden courtyard, and yeah, red bricks all the way through. I don't remember seeing this. I've only been to D.C. once, so I don't, I don't remember if I've seen the Smithsonian. But uh, yeah, fascinating stuff. Here's a. Well, this, I think, is this the same building, Smithsonian American Art Museum? Maybe not. These aren't red bricks, but you can't so, see yeah, the So, yeah, so the story of the architects, I mean, in, even like Frederick Law Olmsted, you know, the, the, the famous, um, 
landscape architect who's, mm. you know, there's a volunteer park, which I was just at yesterday because that's where Bruce Lee's grave is. Shout out to Bruce Lee, just passed away 50 years ago yesterday. And I brought my son there to pay homage. Um, but that's right adjacent to volunteer park. And that's an Olmstead park or that might be Olmstead sons, uh, who, you know, apparently carried on his father's legacy. Now we'll circle back around to Olmstead, but Olmstead was a journalist. He wasn't, his, to my, un, to my understanding, wasn't trained as an architect or landscape architect. He was initially, he was a journalist. That was his career. And so, so how, you know, again, how is it that somebody who's trained as a journalist, uh, traveling around the country, gathering stories, um, in the first part of his professional life, his adult life, how is it that he just becomes this master of landscape architecture and, 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 you know, is credited with designing Central Park. And so, yeah, scratch and sniff. What can I say? Well, speaking of Central Park, Cleopatra's Needle has mm -hmm. always kind of baffled me. I wonder if there's a sort of, you know, in that same line of thinking, no pun intended with ley lines, if there was a, you know, sort of energetic acupuncture point there, I mean, they call it Cleopatra's needle. I don't think that's a coincidence, but I wonder, you know, obviously back then they were all obsessed with Egypt because it was all new and freshly discovered. But I wonder, you know, how, how much money, how much time went into putting that Cleopatra's needle in Central Park? I mean, yeah, you know, and, and just to display the Egyptian culture there, I mean, it, it just, it feels like these structures have a energetic purpose, right? I mean, uh, obelisk is something that kind of, doesn't it sort of capture residual energy that rushes by it and kind of funnels it to that point? I, am I thinking of the, the right? Yeah. I mean, I, I see obelisks as antennas, mm. like, you know, vib vibratory, uh, like frequency receivers of some kind they're often outside temples or adjacent pyramids in pairs and i mean you put two tuning forks close to each other and one's vibrating the other's going to pick up that vibration right so why wouldn't stone structures again made of materials that have piezoelectric properties that are producing charge and receiving signal we just discussed that uh yeah and that they took this um, obelisk, I've, I've seen it and I hope they figure out how to preserve it because it seems like the, the ravages of New York City air are kind of, um, have, you know, they're, they're quickly eroding. It's that, being weathered um, considerably, yeah. Yeah, but, and so why would they put it in that particular place as a, you know. Well, you take something from the equator, I think, isn't Egypt like almost not on the equator, but it's much closer to the equator than New York City is. Uh, and also New York City is probably a lot more humid than uh, mm -hmm. than Egypt. So, yeah, I imagine it's eroding uh, a lot faster than it would have if it just stayed where it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on that topic, I find it fascinating that Giza, the Giza, Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramid in particular, I think Randall Carlson talks about this is the like ge geographic epicenter of the, of the world, of the planet. Hmm. Um, I just, uh, how do they determine that? I'm not quite sure. I, but... I know what you're referring to. I think, and I tried to explain this to somebody and they like, you know, got so upset with me as if this oh. was incalculable, but I, it's the center of all of the geographic landmass on the planet. Landmass. I tried to tell my grandfather that who's, I don't know. He, he started watching ancient aliens. So I thought, okay, here's our bridge. We can start to talk about this stuff. And when I said that he lost it, he was like, that you can't even, there's no way you could calculate that. I'm like, well, well they did. <laughs> tell, tell, tell them it also uh, has, has the uh, uh, geometry of circling the square embedded in it. That's what it, and that's what's so yeah. baffling about it. And that's why I think the ancient alien thing gets a little silly because, you know, here my grandpa is concerned with the people who built it rather than what it is and how amazing what it is. I mean, 
it kind of, it feels like a, uh, I don't know if red herring's the right term, but if we could go back to Frederick Olmsted, because this guy is a fascinating character. He's actually born in Hartford, Connecticut, went to Yale College. Um, so another one of these characters that's in this zeitgeist of sort of reality management, right? I mean, that's what it seems like the old world conversation is really the underpins of it is that there's a group of people trying to manage our perception of reality. And in order to do that, they need to erase certain old world sites. But, uh, yeah, here, Frederick Law Olmsted worked on projects all the way from Niagara Falls to, uh, Montreal, Quebec, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Kentucky, uh, California, Berkeley. I mean, he's all over the place. Uh, Sanford University, Palo Alto, California. Yeah, the list is impossibly long. <laughs> yeah. And this is going to blow your mind, Mark, because I found out through my research that Homestead, the father, and then the son, one of the son, I think John Homestead, was the next door neighbor, like across the yard from Henry Hobson Richardson, who is credited with uh, launching the style that is affectionately known as Richardsonian Romanesque. Mm. And that's where my, my, my research led me into looking at uh, the legacy of Richardson. And I love that you used that term. What was it? Reality management. Management. Right. Because that's pretty much, and I, I say this with some um, almost like sadness because he, he, Richardson was such a, a hero of mine, architecturally speaking. Um, I just, I find him to just fit that to a T just that he, his, his legacy doesn't add up, but that they were neighbors. Olmsted and Richardson were neighbors, next door neighbors in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is a stone's throw from Harvard, which mm -hmm. is where, uh, H. H. Richard, Richardson went to study. Yeah. Brookline, Brookline is an interesting place. Uh, past guests on the show, Christopher Knowles, someone who is a friend of mine now, I went and met him in person. He's from this area, and the first time he was on my show, all the way back in episode 18 or something like that, he, uh, he told me about this very strange mob, CIA, Harvard connection that's centered right there in that part of Massachusetts. So I don't know enough to say anymore, and I don't want to get either of us uh, whacked. So we, we should maybe not, not well, talk about the mob, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, but we can we can look at the fact that at the time that they were, uh, Olmsted and Richardson were neighbors, um, Brookline was the wealthiest suburb in America. Right. And it had, I think it was the first country club or something like this in America. It was also with extremely Brooklyn. racist too. I mean, there the the deeds forbade selling uh, any property to any black or Ir Irish person uh, back in the eighteen hundreds. That was to sort of so yeah. I don't know. Hmm. That was maybe before their time. No nope. Irish people allowed, huh? Either. Yeah, we wouldn't have been allowed there, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so. You know, how is that? You know, again, it's like, pause. How, how is it that Olmsted and Richardson were next door neighbors? Now, uh, Richardson, if you look at the list of buildings that he's ascribed with, it's also Im impossibly long. And in my research of him, what I found out was he was very much a middling student. He was very disinterested in academics. He was a Southern dandy who came from an extremely wealthy, prominent family whose grandfather is credited with discovering oxygen, of all things. Um, and so he, he was basically like a Louisiana plantation dandy who, you know, went up to, moved up to Boston, went to Harvard, joined the, um, porcelainian club or the porcelain club um i thought it was the pork porcelainian it's spelled it's spelled spelled like in 
phonetically, I guess, pronounced Porcalinian. It's with a C. Um, I don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced, but they do use the pig, the secret society. It's like the skull and bones of Harvard. And at the time there was like, I mean, it's like the cream of the cream of the cream of the crop is, is, you know, um, president, um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, I believe like that's the kind of people that, you know, are led into this club. So Richardson, Henry Hobson, um, the HH intrigues me because HH is like 33 all by itself. And like, I also feel like, uh, it's hidden hand, right. To me. That's how I look at it. The H is three lines make an H. So an H H would be 33. Right. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, I never thought of that. H H is also, um, weirdly enough, uh, I think it's like a white supremacy thing too. Cause it's like a Heil, you know what? And then, oh, uh, huh. and then also uh, yeah. there's a weirder association too with serial killers overwhelmingly having like those kind of, uh, I don't know if it's three names that all start with the same letter, like H H oh, Holmes. Man, that's so weird that you say that Mark, because I think the, um, do you know the devil in the white city book about the Chicago world's fair? H H Holmes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Holy my, <laughs> my aunt read that book. Uh, funny enough, when we were kind of talking about the world's fairs. Yeah, talk about reality management. That's who I thought of when you first said H.H. H. Richardson. So I guess not quite the same as the uh, serial killers with three names all starting with the same letter. I don't know. I think there are other examples beyond H.H. H. Holmes. But uh, you mentioned his grand great-grandfather discovering oxygen. We should point out that his great-grandfather was Joseph Priestley who Priestley. is a big deal. I mean, he wrote mm -hmm. extensively on electricity and created machines that kind of uh, demonstrated some uses or uh, just the, the reality or the concept of electricity. So him and Benjamin Franklin were working together uh, to a certain extent. And he was one of these Calvinists who, you know, had these kind of odd beliefs for Christians at the time. And a lot of those Calvinists, uh, ended up colonizing New England. So uh, a lot of these like upper crust top level families that come from the East coast have roots in, uh, Calvinism. There's also a weird lunar moonstone that commemorates Priestley in great bar, Birmingham, uh, UK. So tons of weird stuff with Joseph Priestley, but you say Henry Hobson Richardson didn't appear to be as skilled as he should, given his pedigree of, uh, you know, projects that he's worked on all the, this long, you know, resume of his, do you think that it's possible that he is like, we sort of mentioned with Port Jefferson, this sort of person who just kind of claims buildings that were already built or do you think that was just the nature of architecture back then where these men were employing so many people at such little pay that they were kind of taking credit for other people's work while doing very little of it themselves i mean that's possible that's that there it's possible that that's an aspect of it because he did have um you know if mckim mead and white uh, the, the famous New York architects, mm. like New York public library, that, uh, legacy, uh, two of them as McKim and one of the other guys worked, did work in Richardson's office, uh, but it, it, so that, so it's possible that he was just, you know, a sort of a figurehead, uh, who was taking credit. Um, but it's still, the, the story still needs to be scrutinized, I believe, because he is in. You know, in all the history books that I've read and 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 all, everything that I was taught, it's him who is credited with being the genius behind this architectural s style. Um, and I say style in air quotes because you know we look at architecture in terms of styles now. I look at architecture in terms of um, you know f first what is, what is the story that the building is telling as an artifact, and uh, so if I look at a cathedral. I can't, I cannot accept that 
I find it hard to accept that a building like a cathedral that, you know, when we look at, oh, if it's in Europe, yeah, it took 80 years or several generations. And there was, you know, decades of, you know, fathers and sons that passed down, you know, masters, master and apprentice type relationship, passed down skill sets and, um, you know, lifelong apprenticeships and then a village life to support all that. And then, you know, the materials being quarried from somewhere and, you know, the tools being manufactured somewhere else and, uh, you know, and then hewing the, the materials into, you know, what it would take to fit them together in such a way. Um, and, and so it, it, it's this whole sort of, um, tapestry, uh, you know, of, of, of resources and energies and processes and right down to like community life and everything that would go into a cathedral in Europe. But you take that cathedral and you put it in America and it's like, oh, well, that's just like cathedral style. And yeah, we had a bunch of like really, you know, um, really skilled, uh, um, uh, workers that came, you know, just showed up on boats and then took trains and showed up at this area and could knock out a cathedral. I don't see it that way. I see it still as a cathedral that's telling the same story that it would tell in Europe, that you need this full, you know, cornucopia, this, 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 this tapestry of time, processes, resources, uh, you know, um, in engineering, uh, culture, all these supporting elements, it's the same, all that same stuff has to go into a cathedral here. And so if I look at a, a what's a Romanesque, uh, Richard's, what's considered to be Richardsonian Romanesque building, I, I find it really hard to accept that it's just as one genius who, you know, was able to just, you know, come up with all of this himself after again. And like, we can get into it a little bit more, um, not to beat the horse, but he was really a, 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 a an average, like they call it the gentleman C. You know, he was a gentleman C student. They have this thing, this like high society, uh, um, um, the Ivy League institutions. Um, so he wasn't overly concerned with academics. No, he was actually just an average student. And like, if you read books about him, it's repeated over and over again because it can't really mask it. And not only that, he was very, very, very sickly throughout his whole career. And his whole career only spanned like 20 years. Um, he died very young. He died at 47. He was, he was um, obese. He had this gastro uh, disease. Um, he was said to have a, a horrific stutter where he had a really hard time communicating with his clients. Um, he, so much so that he was exempted from military service on account of the stutter he supposedly had. Um, and when I say obese, it's like he couldn't get out of bed towards the end of his career. He had to have like special pulley systems in his house in Brookline, Massachusetts, where his home office was. Um, so, and, and so after being a very average student and, and he, he, he did. So after a couple of years at, um, Harvard, in which he wasn't just in this porcelainian club or porcelain club. Uh, he was also in two others. So he was in three secret societies. Um, and he is known for at the time for his dress, for his flamboyant dress. He was much more into like going shopping for clothes than and, and dressing up as a dandy than any kind of like academic pursuit or interest. But then he goes and he, 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 got into, somehow he got into, I think an uncle sponsored him to go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in Paris, which is, you know, um, uh, the elite architectural institute in Paris. And uh, he, he was going to go there for a short time, I think a year or so. He ended up staying, staying for the entirety of the American Civil War because the war broke out while he was gone. So he just hung out in Paris did his thing there and then came back and immediately out of college, basically immediately got a commission to design Trinity church in Boston. And Trinity church is said to be one of the, the, the greatest masterpieces of American church architecture. Mm. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. And when I look at that building, um, I did a video just, you know, um, 
uh, in conversation with um, uh, Old World Explorations podcast. Um, and he he's this fellow, Chris McKenna, he's great. He's going city by city and just asking these questions in, in every city um, across the across the Americas. And I think it's he's got a fantastic channel. Um, but we sat for, you know, an hour or so and just looked into this legacy of Richardson. Uh, so if people are interested in, in, in delving into this a little deeper, they can check out that video, uh, on my channel, but, um, so for him to come out or for anybody to just come out of college as a young man, you know, somewhere in your, maybe at the time he's in his late twenties or something, middle to late twenties around there. And you're given a commission to design Trinity Church, and you come up with this just absolute masterpiece of architecture. And again, if you look at the facade, just the facade on that, it looks ancient. It looks so old. And it's it's the level of detail on that with the arches and the columns and it's i mean if the it's an old world building if i've ever seen one but you don't you don't even if you're a genius you don't just like come out with that like that's years and years and and cool. decades of apprenticeship and practice and to me and i look at that and i i feel like it's a it's a, at the, at a minimum it's a disservice to the artisanship, to the craftsmanship, to the to the workmanship that goes into a building like that. It right. does it a disservice to look at it as like one a style, two, just the result of one, you know, um one genius mind. Mm. Mm. And for folks who might not be familiar with Massachusetts history or colonial history. This church, Trinity Church, let's know like startup church. That's the church of Boston, along with two or three others that had been there from the beginning. You know, these are historic churches. I think the King's Chapel was the British church. So that was like the Anglican church, the, you know, the, the people who were loyalists during the Revolutionary War would have been allied with that church. I don't know that those churches, uh, you know, survived after the Revolutionary War, at least the same way they were when England was here. But yeah, that's the Anglican church that uh, he's working on there. Now mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think, the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts. So yeah, still, I think that's Anglican or Catholic. I'm not sure. But it's interesting how these buildings, you know, they kind of, uh, they leave such a strong impression. This is a huge church in such a historically rich area. And like you pointed out, this guy straight out of college gets this dream gig. I mean, what are the odds of that? You can say that, you know, he's just, I mean, his grandfather hung out with Ben Franklin. Like he's got connections. <laughs> True, but it's the it's the ability to come up with that as opposed to once again look at the building. What is the story that building is telling us? Mm. To me, it's taught it it speaks to generation after generation of established, you know, uh, guilds and in 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 and, and, and uh, uh, master craftsmen apprentice relationships and to a community and to a industry and a uh, you know, uh, 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 the ability to fabricate and like all of this stuff is having to work together over time, through time to, 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 it's like architecture. I look at architecture as a product of the consciousness, not just the material resources or the economy, but the consciousness of an age. So if, the, if, if, if I see a, um, you know, a, like the Iowa state house, it's got five domes five gold domes in the Iowa state house. It's a, it's mind bending that building. I look at that. I'm like, well, that's a golden age building. Like it had to have come out of a age whose consciousness would be able to produce that. Not just like knocked out, you know, in a few short years as a style. Um, you know, and here's another one. Look up. Um, can, can the audience see the buildings that you're pulling up? 
the ones that you just mentioned, no, I, I'm. But when you pull, can you pull up um, the New York State Capitol building? Okay. Just for another example of a Richardson building attributed to HH. Yeah, that's the one in Albany. Okay. Yeah, yeah I have yes. it down here. Hold on. Uh, Albany City Hall. Uh, would be the state house. Oh, okay. I believe the Capitol building. Yeah, because that's where the governor resides. Mm. Let's see. All right, I got it now. Wow, yeah, this is uh, this is quite a building here. All right, the audience should be able to see it now. Yep. You're looking at the exterior? Yep. Yeah, check out the interiors. Oh. It's, it's, it's labyrinthian in its ornateness. Hmm. Okay, yeah, this is a stairway here that he designed, Hobson. Yeah. Interesting. So, again, it's, you know, if that building were in, you know, in Paris or, or, or Prague, we would except that it was part of, you know, a product of generations and, and you know, centuries of cultural uh, development. But here, yeah, it's just, it's just one of, I think, 80 buildings. I think Richardson has 80 buildings that are attributed to him in 20 years. Yeah, the detail is incredible. Yeah, so um, why did I get into Richardson? Uh, one, because I had to. I had to look at his legacy. He's, again, one of three pillars of American architecture alongside Louis Sullivan, who came next, and then Frank Lloyd Wright, who initially worked for Sullivan and then went off on his own. Um, I, Sullivan is credited with, uh, like the Prairie School architecture, Chicago architecture. Um, I'm going to be looking into him more next, but, uh, I was led to investigate Richardson because of be actually through my research into Seattle, uh, there's an architecture professor at the University of Washington uh, Architecture School, uh, Jeffrey Oxner, who uh, created a book called Distant Corners some years, or Distant Corner being the Northwest, um, some years ago. And uh, he looks at the legacy of uh, Seattle architecture, old Seattle architecture through the lens of this Richardsonian style. Because, and, and this is where the, the rubber really started to hit, hit the road for me in terms of, you know, questioning what, you know, what, just what's going on here, because, um, C Seattle, it's, you know, I, I grew up around outside of Newark. I lived in Newark for some, some years and it's, it, for me, it would be really hard to start doing this kind of research in Newark because I was 350. 400 years old and there's just been waves of immigration. It's like, how do you even begin to kind of like, you know, pull, pull it, pull it apart and, and, and figure out, you know, if there's anomalies, like what came what before what and when and so forth. But Seattle is like all of, you know, 150 years of written history of, you know, in terms of development of Seattle and that's within the advent of, you know, modern photography as we know it, right? So we have, we have a, a record of Seattle's development that we can really look into, scrutinize, analyze, and so forth. Um, and so what, what's so curious about Seattle, in addition to it has this underground, um, which just to fast forward a little bit is a result of this regrading project that went on for, I think like 30 years, starting in the end of the 1800s, going into like the 1920s or so of, and by regrading, I mean, millions and millions of cubic yards of material just washed away with 
you know, water cannons and the ocean water being siphoned from the Puget Sound and blasting away at these mount, you know, hills that are a hundred feet tall. At regrade and then using to fill in uh the the um uh Duwamish River, which became an industrial zone. Um the Duwamish River is an ancient watershed, right? With 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 like, you know, ten thousand years of Native American history alongside of and culture and everything. Um, and then they just cut one part of the city and filled another part of the city and turned the Duwamish into a shipping canal and just, you know, obliterated basically everything. So when you go downtown Seattle, what you're looking at is like a new, is, is, is a terraformed landscape whose, whose natural and, and human history has just been completely wiped away. It's either been cut or it's been filled. Um, and so when they did the filling portion, some of it, so, some of it in order to get a completely level, cause this is, you can see like, this is the objective is to get a completely level area and you can start popping up skyscrapers and having this modern machine of a city built upon, uh, they wanted to just level it. And, 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 and again, like I, I look at Seattle as a machine, basically, um, some of it they was was below grade, so they had to raise those portions up, and they did that by uh, building embankments. And I show this in that video on Underground Seattle. They built they built these embankments that um, <clears throat> alongside of buildings that were there, and they and, and um, buttressed walls along streets, and then it just filled it in, and then they just raised the level of the uh, sidewalk to connect to the second floor of buildings that were pre existing. And so you had a raised street, a raised um, uh, 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 ground floor over here, and then and then there was this big squabble between the city managers and the private building owners, the companies basically that own these buildings and landlords, who was going to pay for the sidewalk. So for years there was no sidewalk. So it was just, you know, if you do the underground tour, they have a lot of funny stories about, you know, drunken drunken marauders falling into the the pits between the the, the new roads and the and the buildings, but. I digress. Um, the portions of Seattle that were regraded, and again, hundred foot, however tall, mountains of of earth that were blasted away by cannon. On top of that, on top, Seattle. Think of Seattle, early Seattle, as a hilly city, just like San Francisco. There was already a city. Right. There was already old world buildings, beautiful, be stunning, ornate, high level architecture with, by the way, really cool infrastructure like street cars running everywhere, electric, electric street trolleys. There was already a city on top before they tore it down and regraded it. In, 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 in that, that early iteration of Seattle, it, the, the time frame for having built all of that was only between, um, let's say, 1870s, late 1870s, and into um, 1889. And 1889 is a pivotal year for all of this research, I feel. That's when Seattle had its great fire. That just wiped out downtown. The old, what they said was just wood buildings, tinderbox, just like Chicago, ready to go up in flames as soon as like a spark flew. And there's always a silly story about how that spark flew. You know, in Seattle, it was a glue pot tipped over in a carpenter's shop, caught fire, and 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 the whole city burned. No, the whole downtown burned. And that downtown burning down, specifically the downtown, is is key information. Because you see that repeat over and over and over again in these very strange city fires. Uh, um, you could just list almost every city, almost every major city in America burned down at around this time. And almost always it's the downtown business district. Um, and so Seattle was this, what, 1889. Before that, as mentioned, the city on the hill that was there before they it's it's so there's multiple things happening there 
there's an there's an early iteration of a city, city on a hill with streetcars and ornate buildings and everything made out of, by the way, made out of brick and stone and granite and beautiful columns, beautiful arches. Uh, I, I, I've shown these videos, um, pick photos of the of the rubble. And it looks again like Chicago after the fire or say Hiroshima or something. Um, buildings that were feet thick of masonry that just looked like they were blasted away. And so what happened to the story of the wood, clapboard, tinderbox, you know, settler city that was just ready to go up with the match? Because what I look at when I see these um, photos of Seattle fire, what I see is ruins of rubble and of brick and stone. And, and, and that, so you get the story where that was, you know, that, that early iteration of the city was only given like 15 years in, in the narrative to even have been built out of, not to say of nothing, but out of a wilderness, right? Out of, you know, and we're talking street grids, infrastructure, trolleys, the port, you know, like, um, factories, you know. It, it, it's on and on with what, what does it take to build a city out of, out of a wilderness, you know, in addition to all the stuff you see above ground with the ornate brick and stone buildings themselves. And at that time, you know, we're talking about, I think in like 1880, there was 3000 people in Seattle. So how do, you know, where, where's, where's the workforce? Where's the army of workers of, of skilled craftsmen, you know, coming from Italy or Spain or where have you and showing up here and, and, and making all this stuff happen. So, so you have this story of like this earlier iteration of the city that gets, the downtown gets burned down in 1889. Then there's this very strange follow-up story where, you know, I talk about phantom architects a lot in my podcast where this, um, where these architects show up like this guy, um, Fisher, F F I. S H E R Fisher. Um, it, it, he's credited with hundreds of buildings and supposedly in the 18 months after the Seattle fire, there was some like 3,500 or th almost 4,000 new buildings produced within 18 months immediately after the fire. But basically the, the downtown just got rebuilt all over again. And, and, and then, and then you have the regrade projects where they, there's still a city on a hill. There's still this stuff up here that wasn't downtown that didn't get burned down. And if people are interested, go look at my videos because these buildings are awesome. They're huge. They're massive. They're ornate. They're made of brick and stone in old world styles. And they're up on these hills. Well, they just not, they just, they're in the way, knock them down, blast them, get them out of there, and then blast the hills with water cannons. It's called hydraulic, I guess, hydraulic um, mining, what have you, which I've kind of find that part curious, Mark. And there's questions. It's like, quite, like again, back to the thread, pulling on a thread and just start to kind of like go mad a little bit because I'm I just that part of it alone that they used hydraulic mining to reduce these massive hills to, you know, flatten them out and basically wash the earth away, wash it into the Duwamish River, wash it into other places that they wanted to fill. And you could see the pictures online or just look like they're very surreal. Um, how did they know, just a question, how did they know that they could blast this away with water cannons? Because I built a house in Seattle when I moved out here 20 years ago. And when I was digging for the foundation is in North Seattle in a community called Lake city. I was digging for the foundation. I got down two or three feet and I hit hard pan. Hard pan is hard as a rock. It's like, it's itself like concrete. And I couldn't like, I'm using a pretty big excavator and I couldn't break through it. It's really, really hard material. So how did they know that these hills would have just been, you know, you start a project like that, you better be able to finish it, right? How did, it's just a question, like, how did they know that they could use 
those techniques to remove that material at such a scale, um, I find that to be curious as well. And so then I look at this questions of um, mud flood and it's like, it's just curious, you know, and if there was such an event that washed, you know, um, silt like material over a huge area um, at some time in a relatively recent past, it would have had to have been, and if that's, what that material is. So if there's some knowledge that they could have removed it with water cannons because they wouldn't have hit hard pan or just bedrock. They would have just kept washing away silt. Um, one, it implies like some kind of knowledge that that's what that material was at depth. You know, we're talking about at depth, dozens and dozens and dozens of feet. And also it implies it kind of starts to give a time frame. For when that might have occurred, that if there was some kind of catastrophic, catastrophic event, because as I mentioned, there was a city on that hill. There were old buildings on those, you know, foothills, not mountains, but foothills that they removed in the early decades of the 19th or the 20th century. Is this making sense, Mark? Yeah, no, it's making a ton of sense. Now, given I'd never been to Seattle, it's hard for me to really like visualize uh, some of what you're saying. But now that I'm I'm looking online, I'm seeing some images, I'm finding some brick buildings. Do you have any examples? I mean, there's the you whole underground this. element of Pioneer Square where people can go down and see the original street yeah. level, right? And even this sinking ship garage kind of implies that there was something here before that has sunk into the ground. I mean, that... the sinking ship garage is just a, a shitty parking garage that they put in place of a beautiful ornate old world building that was once there. Yeah. They well, tore down in Pioneer Square. Well, yeah. it seems like uh, sort of ironic maybe tongue in cheek or two on the nose, but like, Hey, we just sunk your old world history, so to speak. Like here it is a sinking ship, this disgusting, brutalist capitalism garage. There, there's, there's a lot of that in Seattle and it's, it's, um, huh. yeah, it's hard. It's hard not to get cynical living here, man. You know, I'm not long for the city. It's just cause there's so much of that. And it's like, I, I, when I first moved to Seattle, so I don't want to get too sidetracked on this, but I just had a feeling like I was, I was arriving at a place where the party had kind of just ended. Hmm. You know, there was a lot of, it seemed to me like there was a lot of cool things that were going on in Seattle. And it's just not, I don't know. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing where like you had a beautiful building, you tore it down, you put up a sinking ship parking garage. You know, it's, it's this, I feel like it's a city that's gonna, it's run by bureaucrats and, 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 technocrats and again back to the idea of the architecture reflects the consciousness of the age well if you go around downtown seattle right now and you just you know i mean it's it's this really sad story what's going on in downtown seattle right now like it's really 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 tragic um just the 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 the, the human crisis and just in the last three years especially it's gotten really fentanyl junkies and the tents and king encampments and everything that goes along with that it's um it's kind of it's yeah it's just become untenable but i feel like it's i feel like that is the result of you know this just technocratic mindset it's just like screw the humanity we're doing this we're going to proceed you know progress we're gonna like roll out our technocratic you know, city. Um, and thank God Seattle's surrounded by beautiful and powerful nature. You know, we've got Mount Rainier to the south, um, got the Cascades to the east, the Olympics to the to the west, and it's just in, you know, British Columbia's just in the north of us, and we've got the Puget Sound. So that tempers, you know, a a, a lot of um this really kind of like overwhelming um ugliness 
Yeah, it is. And it's, it's like a spiritual thing. Mm. I, I really feel like this stuff is, it's, it's, it's visceral, it's spiritual. Um, yeah. So like I could do a screen share and put some, please put do. some pictures to, to this. Yeah. Cause I'm seeing a lot of what look like modern skyscrapers when I type in like, you know, Hey, what are some of the best architecture examples? There are a few buildings that uh, have this Richardsonian Romanesque look, but they're all post 1900s. I wonder if those don't count as old world or if there are a few maybe extant buildings and, from that time. I mean, are there any buildings from this, these pre disaster times? There are. Yeah, there, there, there are. Um, and don't don't let me wrap this up without kind of tying the bow around this Richardsonian okay. question. And just what you just asked there, I want to circle back around to that. Um, so this is in in I'll try to kind of breeze through this. This is what we're given as like you know the old pioneer town. Can you see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so this is you know 1870, and this is what we're shown as you know, going on in 1870, um, 1880, 1882, you get the Yesler building. Um, I don't know. I look at this and I'm just, I'm baffled 1882 and, um, across Ketty corner to this building, this is the Yesler building, a Yesler, Yesler Leary building. And Yesler is Henry Yesler. He said to him, brought the first um, sawmill to Seattle, which they started cutting down the ancient old growth trees and building the city. Okay, yada, yada. That which burned down in the Great Fire. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this building or this. This is the Occidental Building. And the level of exquisite detail on this is just, it's, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. Right. And, and what I say, what I mean by that is this is complex. Right. You know, this is a really complex uh, uh, piece of architecture and by the way, in engineering. And I find it curious, like, look at the scale of it, Mark, can you see these dudes down here hanging out against the railing? Yeah. Now that you point them out. Yeah. yeah. Look, look at the size. This is floor to floor. This has got to be 15 feet, mm. right? And and every floor repeats the scale of this is just monumental. So if you're just kind of pulling a city out of the wilderness with just a, in 1882, there might have been 5,000 people, right? And you're and and people are, you know, eking out a living. Let's say they're building. You know their own homes, maybe they're laying down farms, they're fishing, they're doing whatever you need to do to survive in a city that you're just building, just propagating. Um, and you take the time to start building buildings that are like this. How do you even heat this thing? Like, if you have 14 or 12 foot ceilings, you know, what have you, um, these windows themselves look like they're 12 feet tall. Where are you getting all that glass from? You know, what, how, how do you, are there fireplaces in every one of these rooms to keep it warm? Like Seattle gets cold. It's not, it's not like Missouri cold or, you know, Connecticut cold, like those kind of winters, but it's like, it gets into your skin wet cold for six months. Right. And so any masonry building would also be cold unless you could keep that masonry warm. Right. And so how are you doing that? And why waste the resources on such a thing? Um, and then you get buildings like this, Fry's Opera House. Th so <clears throat> here's two different iterations, art, uh, artist renderings. This is also uh, a, a, a very ornate, ornate old brick and stone building. And the reason I know that is because one of the fire photos that I have from the Chicago Fire show the ruins of this. So it's a, it's a ruin of brick and stone. Um, so this, this burned down in the great fire. Um, you have buildings like, um, let me show you a photograph of this. 
um, Central High School. Let's see. Do you see this? This is supposed to be a high school? This was supposed to be a high school. Wow. Seattle Central High School. This, uh, th I was, I was actually in Prague a few months ago. This looks like a building that was out of Prague. It's got this, like what we affectionately refer to as antiquitac with these, you know, um, antennas yeah. that they say are flagpoles coming up, but, you know, and so I, I, you know, looking at it again through the lens of, you know, I, I ascribe to electric universe theory. I believe that everything is essentially electrical or electromagnetic. And so I, I think in order to understand buildings that were, I, I, I think in order to understand Antiquitech, let's say, we have to, we have to um, begin to look at this electric universe theory and also um, take on board that whoever produced buildings that were employing antiquitech type architecture understood that the universe is electromagnetic, that reality itself is electromagnetic, magnetic. that when we talk about electrical architecture, or I, I like the term electrical architecture, I'm not talking about a building that collects energy and then you can plug your cell phone to charge into the wall socket in the stone. It's that there's something happening electromagnetically that A, can uplift your mind, body, and spirit, and also be over here, do something somehow um, to produce a, a physical, you know, a, 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 a physical outcome, a physical effect, mm. be it, can the building warm itself? You know, we've looked at these radiant fireplaces, for instance. Can, can the, the alchemy of these materials coming together in such a way actually produce a, a warming effect to where you don't need wood burning fireplaces well and in that's, structures like that's this. kind of where i thought you were going with it as soon as you sort of insinuated that earlier and it prompted me to look up or ask the question to my search engine here how uh how is the electrical grid or what's the history of the electrical grid i found an article called how has the electrical grid changed and it says that in 1882, the United States created its first electrical grid. And after the Great Depression, the electrical or the electricity industry transformed from competitive and unregulated to regulated and monopolized by zones. Before and after both sounds corrupt and fishy. And it also mm -hmm. sounds like the type of atmosphere where these very wealthy types would say, hey, Let's delete all this old world architecture because we're not going to be able to charge people money to live in their houses if they use this old world technology. We need to give them basically houses that are cold without our help so that we can charge them to live. Correct. Now, wow. one thing that I have noticed over and over and over again, Mark, is that, uh, can you see my mouse? Yes. These towers on these old buildings, nine times out of 10, when these buildings survive, the towers are gone. Huh. Somebody doesn't like these towers or whatever is going on up in here with all this antiquitech. Right. And all the maybe bell towers, maybe clock towers. I mean, these look, this is so curious. Like what, are, what sort of device are we looking at? Yeah, that doesn't Design. even look like a, a clock face there. I mean, it could be, but I, I won't understand where the uh, hands of the clock are. And if this building is so high, you know, how would someone be able to read the clock if the hands weren't pretty obviously there? I mean, yeah. maybe it's just the quality of the photo, but the finials and uh, I don't know what the weather vanes maybe on top of these um, points on the roof here, some of them kind of look like the Fure de Lance. Fure de Lee. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then others are just straight poles. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I forget what exactly I was reading the other day, but there was something about weather vanes and roosters and how roosters are connected somehow to electricity, and that's why they put roosters on top of uh, on top well, they of wake up with the, the weather sun, vane. Which is interesting. In right. Hell, well, electricity is 
hell is God and then all that stuff. I don't I know. That's think, interesting. I think it was this guy, Paul Stobbs, who, who does uh, research into the Nephilim. He was talking about this and how the rooster symbolizes hmm. some sort of ancient being oh. that had something to do with power and electricity. So, yeah. So there's clues hidden in plain sight all over. And I, yeah. you know, again, it's like we talked about, we started out earlier talking about obelisks having some kind of a resonant resonance quality to them. Um, so when I, when I see, you know, these kind of spires and spires on spires and towers coming out of towers, it's like, I st I look at this as a resonant structure. You know, picking up frequencies. Right. And what is it doing with it? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Like, but I know that they keep knocking uh, the, the 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 tops off these buildings when they allow them to stick around. Here's another example. This is uh, the Pioneer Building, which is said to be this is said to be uh, Henry Yesler's last building that he sponsored. You know, as again, founding father of Seattle. Um. You can visit Pioneer, the Pioneer building today, and which is great that it's still here, but the tower is missing. Uh, so they took the tower down. Um, Wait, now when you say they took the tower down, are you talking just about this triangular? Yep. Right there. Okay. So where this your mouse cuts has off. This antenna. Yeah. Now, I, see, what I saw when I saw this for the first time, I immediately thought, those rocks stacked above that entrance arc in the center, they seem to be stacked on top of each other. I mean, I don't know if they're rocks, but they look like each one it's, of those is a solid one piece rock or a piece of cement that's meant to look like, you know, one solid piece. I wonder, yeah. you know, you see this a lot with these types of buildings. I wonder if these like protruding vertical lines on the sides of these buildings are meant to channel the energy down straight to the ground, giving it like a direct line, direct current, right? Because you see all those rocks stacked on top. Yeah, see, I mean, it looks like those were rocks just pulled out of the river and then just stacked on top of each other and, you know, adhesed together. It's a very curious, um, you know, stylistically, uh, that, yeah, it's a very curious uh, application with this type of texture. One thing that the architecture of Seattle Wikipedia page said, and I'll read it right now because it's kind of interesting the way they word it, but it says that um, Seattle, the largest city in the Pacific Northwest region of the U.S., features elements that predate the arrival of the area's first settlers of European ancestry. So I know they're, they're sort of talking about the native influence architecture. That could be an example of that where there's just, you know, sort of more uh, rudimentary stone uncut, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, it does feel vague the way they put that as the first sentence. Like when I first read that, I was like, whoa, then I go further and they kind of describe how there's like longhouse style buildings that have been created to commemorate the original inhabitants. But Maybe there's more. I mean, there are legends of the Cherokee having, uh, you know, sort of palatial states and brick buildings. Is it possible that the uh, <clears throat> people who are the Duwamish tribe and maybe their neighbors had more advanced architecture skills than we're told? Because there's some descriptions of longhouses out on the East Coast that are very elaborate and ornately designed i mean now we're told longhouses were just sort of wooden reed constructions but is it possible that they had stone and other elements involved i i, I mean i mean again it's like look what are what does our lying eyes tell us like look look at this photograph and in the question of what what did the indians know or you know how come they you know i find that to be a compelling question but at the same time it's like well you know, the, the, the tragically, horrifically, the, the, the Native American, Native American population, the population we attribute, we credit with being native to Turtle Island, um, went through generations of, uh, you know, genocide. Cult, yeah. Yeah. Culture wash and brain, you know, like talk about reset and, um, you know, re-education um right. camp and the whole thing like you know atrocities basically yeah but it's like a mind wipe 
right? right? So it's like, what did they know? I don't know. Do they know? And it's not, that's not no disrespect to anybody. Far from it. Like I, I, I look at a, a, a photograph like this, this, this to me is damning because this, this is front street before the great fire. This is not wood and brick building. I mean, I'm sorry. This is not wood clapboard tinderbox type construction from Henry Yesler's sawmill and old growth trees that were just waiting for somebody for some spark, you know, for old Miss O'Leary's cow to kick over a lantern or for some glue pot to tip over. And, you know, every city, like I said, New York City is hilarious. New York City, it's a ball of yarn caught on fire and a kid threw out a window and burned down New York City. Like there's these really cartoonish, like children's story backstories to all these urban fires. So not to digress, but did the early inhabitants of Seattle, indigenous people, participate in high level? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is high level construction, architecture, and engineering, and, and, and urban development. It's, it's a fascinating question. Were they given a different, you know, were they given another story right. that, you know, they're nomadic and, and, and um, you know, sim simple? Right. More, more of a simple type people, folks. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know how much evidence there is for that Cherokee brick building stuff. Uh, that, as far as I've heard, was centered around St. Louis, which has its own amazing architecture to talk about, I'm sure. But yeah, I don't think we give the Native Americans enough credit for uh, even the stuff that we've recognized them building like the mounds and maybe even some mm -hmm. of these stone structures that are all nestled up here where I live. Um, you must have seen them when you spent time in New Jersey, uh, the stone walls and things like that. But yeah, it definitely seems like all these other places, Florida is another great example where you have multiple different cultures before the European settlers uh, interacting with one another, building things, and then mm -hmm. this homogenization takes place where the new settlers have to essentially recreate an explanation for what was there first, right? I mean, I don't see there's any other way to look at this. Yeah. And again, it's like I don't, I don't care what we call it. Right? <laughs> like it was called Tartaria. I really don't care. I just don't want to get distracted by that. Mm. I want to be able to look at a, a photograph like this, know that this was before 1898, know that the population, all this stuff we talked about, the infrastructure development, the material resource, the railroad wasn't even here. They didn't even have the, into the transcontinental railroad completed by the, you know, by the time these buildings were being built. So, okay, so then they had to bring all those materials by ship and so forth, and maybe bricks were being made in San Francisco. San Francisco is another one. Like we could look at that, yeah. bird's eye, you know, that panorama of San Francisco and it's like, you know, 20 years, you've got, you know, dozens of cathedrals going on, you know, by the 1860s, 1870s. So anyway, I see a building like this and this is so advanced. The architecture, like we're looking at all this antiquitech. This is that down at the corner here. This is that Yesler building. We're looking at, but it was a whole, it wasn't just standalone buildings. It was a whole street, you know, built out and look at the level of sophisticated detail that went into this, Mark. Okay. 1889, right? 1889, fire happens, the great fire, because for whatever reason they tell us, and I mentioned to you before, like that these the masonry is feet thick. I mean, I'm looking at like two, three feet thick of, of brick and brick, you know, like how, and this, these were, these, were, this was the one that the building was, you know, 15 foot floor to floor. This was a massive masonry structure and they're just obliterated. Um, and in 1889, here's, here's, um, remember I told you the Fry's Opera House, I showed you that, that artist rendering of, this is it. This is that building. Um, wow. Yeah. And so in, this is in the summer of 1889, Mark. Okay. Washington's not yet a state. 
This is where my research started to get really interesting. Do you know what else happened in the summer of 1889? Ellensburg burned down. And that, this is Ellensburg. And, I, and, and Spokane burned down. Okay. I'm sorry. This is Seattle. But Spokane burned down. Now, at S Seattle, Ellensburg, and Spokane, downtown business districts, all burned down within two, like, I think two months of each other in the summer of 1889. Do you know what else was going on at that time? Is there was a statehood convention to bring Washington territory into the Union going on this summer. It started in May. Washington didn't want to enter the Union. There was Washington was a hold of territory. And like, thanks, no thanks. We like being a territory up here in the Northwest by ourselves or whatever. We got our own thing going on. Well, all of a sudden, three major cities, and all, all of which, each of which was vying, you know, in its own way, there's all these competing forces to be the new capital, should Washington become a state, burned down, just the, just the business districts, gone, obliterated. Within, by November, I think November 7th, so within three months later, Washington elects to become... I don't know what it was, the 40, 40, 42nd state or something like that. So to me, that begs a much bigger question in, 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 in an area of research that gets very little coverage. I, I haven't seen really much on this at all anywhere, which was what this whole statehood project or this whole, I'm sorry, federal project of, of bringing territories in to become to join the union, to be states. I don't think it was so warm and fuzzy, man. <laughs> yeah. I think it was all out war going on. And to me, I look at this and I'll just tell you my feeling is I look at this as a shock and awe campaign. Like you don't want to join the union. Well, guess what? We got bigger guns than you. We're going to blow up your old world downtown districts and drag you in. And now you're part of the United States. Well, and, and, and me, I imagine... Like, well, it was pretty simple to, you know, cause this destruction and then say, hey, we're the federal government. Let's give you a loan to rebuild and, you there know, you do it our right. way, the way we describe. Yeah. So our it's, companies I mean, can get in and build these electrical grids. They've already, I mean, yeah, Mark, it's the same story over and over. It's rinse and repeat. Uh, it's going on in Ukraine right now. Like they've already said, it's going to be the new shiny modern utopia once all the you know, the shouting stops. Right. And, and so this is what they do. It's terrifying. Um, but I really think it take, it re this requires like a, a hard look. And also because, you know, on the lighter side of things, we had beauty, you know, we had, th this is Ellensburg. This is downtown Ellensburg. Like this, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's easy to be cynical about the country that we live in because of, the madness and the ignorance and the, and the, and the backwardness that plays out. But this is what we had. This is what our cities looked like. This is what, you know, Ellensburg, which is in central Washington, um, lost when, when, when that, you know, a cow kicked over land, whatever, actually in Ellensburg, it's, it's said to be arson, but it's also said that it's unknown. What was the cause of the fire? So there were some newspaper reports at the time that um, suggested arson or, or what have you. Um, wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing stuff. I, reminds me of some of the stuff that is here in New England. I don't know that there was much of a need to uh, convince any of the 13 colonies to, <laughs> you know, stay in the Union. They were all pretty much owned by the time that Seattle and all these cities were being founded out West, they were all pretty much thoroughly controlled. So maybe that explains why, you know, in the same time period, we don't have the same kind of massive city fires in places like 
Boston or Hartford or New Haven. I mean, there's very few examples I'm pretty sure of that Boston on the East had Coast. A, had a conflagration mark. Yeah, you know what? As I said that, and as you said that, I'm kind of reminded of that. Yeah. Hmm. So New maybe York that's the case. Maybe Boston had the same sort of threat where, <laughs> you know, they were made to. Uh, I maybe it wasn't even political in that side. Maybe it was that industrial side of things where. They were resetting the way the country functioned where, you know, we got to get rid of these old insulated stone buildings so that we can yeah. charge people for, you know, uh, energy, yeah. heat. Yeah, maybe they just look at it as business, it's just business, you know, it's just a practical question for them. They're like, well, how do we shoehorn this new, you know, electrical and plumbing and whatever infrastructure right. into these old cities. What a pain. Let's just knock them down. Right. That's, and I think that's really what I'm trying to say is that there's, there was a infrastructure sort of reset going on. And a mm -hmm. lot of this old world architecture fell victim to that. And maybe there was a political agenda uh, coached alongside of that as well. Mm -hmm. Now here's, yeah, here's, you know, again, old, this is the Denny Hotel up here on the left. This this says this photo is from 1907. This area was regraded. And then it was turned into this. And it's, I mean, I have a hard time believing all this happened in two years, but that's what this photo says. Um, so here's your new, you know, your new metropolis and your new, um, you know, ma machine type city. And he, he, here's another example. It's, um, this up in the left upper left corner is the uh, um, King County, the original King County court, Courthouse. Um, and again, old world building, if I've ever seen one. Um, and uh, and so here is this overlay, like this area, this hill up here would have been washed down. But in the meantime, they're bringing in and you, I love this picture because you can you can see how the new grid is just like oozing over the landscape, right? And and so you can see how like the, some of these buildings would have already been here and they just do this raised sort of viaduct type of highway thing. And you can see how under these sidewalks, you'd have this underground zone that today you can still go and visit, you know, the Seattle underground um, with all its weirdness. And then you get these, what, in, you know, from one angle, to, oh, it's mud flooded and this and that, we see these basement windows going down below grade but then if you kind of like roll back how it actually unfolded over time you can see that well, the building was there then they raised this the, the the grade of the city and um and then some of those um windows just receded under the sidewalk line and i'm not, i'm not saying that's the case with all below grade windows um because again i guess like i think there's a strong case to make that there was some type of conflagration Mm. in the recent past relatively recent past um that was you know left these like huge silt mounds silt foothills that were then built upon at one time you know and 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 it's just progression just unfolds and unfolds and unfolds over time and has all of these different iterations right. um just because we're talking about the regrade we'll look at this this is what they were doing washing away all of this stuff with water cannons and grade might not be a familiar term for everybody so i mean think mm -hmm. roads when you're going down a steep road yeah. and it's uh, you have that sign on the side of the road that says you know grade nine percent or whatever this is what he's saying i mean it's a little late for this i'm sure people have caught on with the context but yeah i just grade yeah. might not be a readily available term for everybody yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Sometimes I, I forget. That's all right. Um, here again, check it out. Check this out. And I, I, you know, if people at home or what have you, the audience is listening to this. If you get a chance to, to watch it as well, you'll, you'll get a much richer sort of, um, picture. Um, uh, um, because, you know, here we're showing earthen a very odd mark isn't this very strange like these hills are just kind of knobs and they go up and they go down and there's houses and built in within and around all these old buildings are just kind of like following the landscape of this earlier iteration of development that happened who knows when mm. i don't um but then they knock all this up here they knocked it down washed away all of these mounds um and you know, that are 80, 100 feet tall. 
And then just, you know, so you look at the uh, photo from below, this is specifically, this is the Denny Hill regrade. There was many, um, Denny Hill is one that gets a lot of the, you know, fame and whatnot, um, or notoriety. Um, but then it turns into like what looks just like a, it looks like a massive, massive parking lot, but it's really just um, a, a new grade, a new level. You know, they just leveled it all. So now we're going to start over with a new street grid, sell the real estate, you know, to the highest bidder kind of a thing. And then modern office buildings are going to start popping up as we see today, like so many mushrooms. Um, one more of this idea, this is I-5 blasting through downtown, which was, once would have been hills. And then I see a building like this, and this is um, some Presbyterian church. And I look at that and I, you know, I scratch my head and like, when, when was that from really? Right. Because you know, all this stuff just happened around it. Yeah. Wow. Huh. And again, with the stones that seem like found stones loose stones that probably would have been part of the environment uh used to to create these very large scale projects you know very i mean what is that three stories the church? this building here yeah oh gosh i mean you have one story two stories there's a very odd stair that looks like it's coming up to a second story here because it's on a little bit of a slope so right. Four you know, stories, three almost. into this attic, four, five. I mean, it's really seven. Wow. I mean, this pro the top of this is probably at least a hundred feet tall, if not more. Wow, twenty feet. It's yeah. These are formidable edifices, right? Um. Now, Mark, I don't know how long you want to go with this because I I want to to circle back around to your question about are there buildings that are still intact, and um, yeah. I just want to give mention to that. I did the I did a whole deep dive history into Port Townsend, which is just across Puget Sound, um, from Seattle. It's on the it's on the tip of the Olympic Peninsula, and Port Townsend is absolutely fascinating because it's preserved. It, they 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 went through great pains to preserve their old building stock, and so here we have. Remember, I mentioned Fisher, that architect, the, 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 the architect, the phantom architect that shows up and then just as quickly disappears in the, in the, in the narrative. And it's always like self trained architect from Ohio, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is said to be a Richardsonian building built in the style of H.H. H. Richardson. It's the uh, uh, Jefferson County Court, uh, Jefferson County. Um, building jefferson county um courthouse yes and the again it's like the level of detail on this it just it just boggles boggles my mind anyway and um the, you know so this is going on at the same time these buildings are 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 showing up in seattle in this impossible timeline with insufficient you know population levels to say the least and the same thing is happening right across the water in an even more remote location in port townsend now I, I i marvel at the fact that this building still exists that the tower still exists this is the type of thing that would be disappeared if they were to keep this building at all and there are examples of that all over port townsend where so for instance you have this building which is the city hall said to have been built in 1890 and um, check this out, Mark. You'll appreciate this very much. Um, so this is the old city hall, ye olden city hall, right? 1890. Well, 1860, it looked like this. They kept oh. the building. And then they even went to the um, um, effort of remodeling this, this wreck uh, uh, of, you know, there's just, it's, I, I mean, I see this just makes me sad, you know, <clears throat> and um, they remodeled it into a, a, a museum of art and history, which is wonderful and, and, and good on them. But this is what they started with. And there's always a story of like, oh, in 1940, there was an earthquake or there was a hurricane or there was something that rattled the roof and not, you know, they had to take the tower down. But that story, um, that story just kind of comes up like 
like old Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over a, a, a land. It's just like there's these, it's like these formulaic storylines um, that are just, you, you start to see them enough and you start to, you could just kind of guess them. Um, and Port Townsend, interestingly, has its own underground. And like, I'm like, how did Port Townsend get its own underground where you can go down and there's a street level down below and there's storefronts below the street grade. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't figure out how until um, I show it in here. I'll show you this um, just to paint the picture or here. Um, again, brick buildings, 1890. Um, and uh, this whole area of downtown was filled in according to a geologist that I found, a local geologist, trained professional geologist, did um, a YouTube video, which I came upon in doing this research. And he did an analysis of, uh, um, of the, of, you know, various layers of, of um, earth and stone in this portion of downtown Port Townsend, because this, this abuts, this, it's a, it's a waterfront, um, it's a waterfront community. You can see here, right? There's, you know, you're right up on, you're right up on the Puget Sound. And so what he said is that this whole area of downtown was filled. So at one time to basic, like Battery Park City, New York, so like they just filled it in to extend the real estate out into the water so they could build more buildings. So that answers the question of how does it have an underground, but it doesn't answer the question of, to me of like, it makes it even more impossible to understand. Like, so not only did they build all these buildings in record time with so few people and resources, but they also had to actually fill in the downtown first. They actually had to fill in the land itself in order to build upon. I'm like, who is doing this? Who, who, where is all of this energy and labor and Where's it coming from? And so it's, you know, full circle, I guess, Mark, it's to this question of um, who built what and when and how. And I don't think any of us have any real good answers at this time for this. But I think the questions, like arriving at the right questions, is a really good way to approach this whole research. Um, because yeah. it's the implications are just, um, you know, the implications are that our whole story that we have about who we are and where we are is off by a lot. Right. And we have to do some serious regrouping and rethinking, you know, who are we and where are we is, you know, not for the faint of heart. Yeah, no, it's a big, big area of mystery what exactly went down before the United States became the 50 United States. And yeah, you've raised a lot of questions here that I don't think we could find the answers to. I wonder, you know, Wilhelm Reich was around back then. Maybe they used some sort of weather machine to cause uh, the mud floods that people talk so much about. I mean, it's already a place that gets record precipitation every year. You know, you said it's, it would be a tremendous feat to fill all that in. Maybe they use some sort of weather manipulation to provoke the effect they desired. And, you know, disaster capitalism, they put the federal money insurance in place to, you know, I guess recoup their losses. But yeah, wow. So people can expect to find more of this at Marvelous Old World, your channel, which I will link in the description so people can go and check that out on YouTube. I'm going to put this video on YouTube as well. So people just go right over and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe to this channel as well. Give it a like, comment, tell us how much you loved Matt here being on the show. Matt, any final thoughts? Anything you want to plug? Obviously, you have a business designing things for people. So if there's anyone in the audience that wants a guy like Matt to work with them on their project, I mean, if you're watching a video like this, maybe Matt can, 
use some piezoelectric materials. I mean, what I'm sure you're thinking of that kind of stuff in your downtime, right? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I go to sleep thinking about this stuff, wake up thinking about it. Um, it's, it's my passion and it's, you know, looking at this history, like, well, you know, we were kind of touching upon, it can get a little bit dark and it's, you know, that professor I mentioned in the beginning, Jack Lebduska, he used to say that our, uh, you know, young people get involved in architects because they're optimists. You know, I, it's, it's a passion. It really is. Like, and when I look at what we lost, it's only because like I mourn it, you know, and, and I, I would like to learn from it so that we, and, and we can apply what, you know, we can apply what we learn from to building a new and better world. And to me, that's really what it comes down to. And, um, professionally, yeah, I like, I, I, I try to apply these practices. Like I build um, to the extent that I can with the opportunities that I have, um, I, I, I specialize in building roundhouses, wooden yurts, um, and they're beautiful structures. It, it's, it's, it's its own niche market, which is great. Cause it, I don't, I'm not kind of out there in the, um, mixing with other architects much, which I, I like because I don't really like where the profession is right now. Um, and just, you know, one look at the type of you know, condo development that's going on all over around me here in office buildings. And again, it's that technocratic, bureaucratic mindset that I think has really infected the profession itself. Um, so I get to design really cool houses for people that are round for the most part. Um, round buildings are exquisite by their nature because it's like this pure geometry. You have pure tension at the bottom of a roof, a conical roof, and you have this pure compression element of this compression ring at the top. And it creates like this drum effect. And it's like, you can stand in the middle of one of these buildings and before all the walls and everything goes up on the inside and, and hum. And just, it sounds like the voice is coming from inside of you. So to me that, you know, it's just that experience, that visceral experience. It's very uplifting. Um, people walk into these houses and then they just light up, they smile. They don't even know why they just feel something differently. Um, and so. Yeah, if anybody wants a roundhouse design, uh, look me up. Or if you're just curious, yeah, dreamdesignbuild.org. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, Mark, this has been fantastic. Thank you yeah. for the opportunity to put these ideas out there. Yeah, thank you for joining me again. Like I said, folks, follow Marvelous Old World on YouTube and dive in. I mean, right now you've covered some areas in Seattle and I'm sure... You're only just beginning. So I'm excited to follow up with your channel and have you back on. Maybe we could talk more about Seattle or San Francisco, whichever city you set your sights on next. But until next time, folks, stay posted. Look around you. Maybe the old world is still right in front of you. <laughs>